I'm Claudia Catania, and you're listening to Playing On Air. You're about to hear our latest world premiere, Tech Demons by Sarah Gancher. Gancher's plays have been produced both here and abroad. She's received not only this James Stevenson Commission for Short Comedic Play from Playing on Air, but also the Richard Rogers Award for Musical Theater, New York Stage and Film Founders Award, and the A.R. Gurney Prize. Tech Demons features our longtime friend J.O. Sanders, recently in Broadway's Girl from the North Country, and our new friend Isaac Oliver, author of the essay collection Intimacy Idiot and writer for Glow and High Maintenance. They are directed by Mark Bruni of Broadway's Beautiful, the Carol King musical. And now, Tech Demons, a short play in six scenes. The time is the present. We open in Izzy's Washington Heights Junior One bedroom as he's placing yet another call to Gray Tech Support. Welcome to Gray. We have opened the portal. Walk through. If you know your party's extension, you may dial it at any time. For sales, press 1. For customer service, press 2. For account services, press 3. For technical support, press... Schoenberg. Okay, that's a choice. Welcome to technical support. If this is an emergency, please hang up and dial 911. Negative spiritual conjurations, or NSCs, commonly known as demons, are unpredictable forces. Contact NSCs at your own risk. Gray is not liable for any supernatural damage to persons, property, or psyches. If you have a pulmonary condition... Welcome to Gray. There's a field between right and wrong. I'll meet you there. My name is Jerry. How can I help? Wow. They got a script, man. Hey, I get it. I've worked a job. Name, address, and serial number? Isidore Martin Williams, Izzy, 579 West 215th Street, New York, New York, 10034. Serial number? Uh... Do you have the box? I do, shockingly. Upper right on the spine of the box. At 218-5910. No, it's not. Yes, it is. That number's not in my system. Are you sure those are the numbers you're seeing? 218-5910. Most of my serials start with 9... Well, it looks like an antique, perhaps? I, don't, I just found it in my uncle's stuff, his effects. What, what's a kit model? Demon Lover? No. Beginner's Revenge? It's a Mephistopheles starter kit. Uh, all due respect, ma'am, I doubt that. That's what the box says. Oh, hell. Is that good? That's one heck of a good find, is what that is. You know what that's worth on eBay? Okay, well, it, it doesn't work. Well, then you must be doing something wrong. That's why I'm calling. I drew the pentagrams, and I lit the candles, and I sprinkled the salt and the oil and the other fluids. I said the words, which, what language was that anyway? Is that Greek? Well, I'm not an expert on that particular kit, but generally speaking, most of our incantations are Aramaic. Whatever it was, I'm sure I mangled it. Languages are my Achilles heel. I once told a waiter in Paris I was a fire hose. (laughs) Anyway. The lights went out, the pentagram caught on fire, which I thought was very on the nose, but then the lights came back on, the fire disappeared, and nothing. Except I hear this breathing, panting, really fast, like an animal, and I turn around, and on my couch there is a big black poodle. A really bedraggled one. Well, well, well. So I'm assuming I was not supposed to conjure a poodle? I don't know why this happened, but if I had to guess, the ingredients in the kit were... Well, the vial of blood was pretty dried up, the dead bat was missing, and the so-called Eye of Newt looked like everything but the bagel seasoning. So, I'm just not confident my spell had the right texture store. Now, what's the poodle doing now? It's on the couch. It's... Actually, it's not. It's... Oh. <gasps> um, the poodle is in the kitchen. It's doing my dishes. That's him. That's Mephistopheles? <gasps> what? He looked at me! Are you Mephistopheles? Are you... <gasps> Ma'am? <sighs> Ma'am, is he? Could I call you back? Extension 547. Thank you for calling Gray. 
Now we see as through a glass, darkly. But soon we shall see each other, face to face. If you know your party's extension, you may dial it at... This is Jerry, yellow. Hi. Finally. Yeah, I need help. This is not What's very... What's going on? What's going on? What's okay, happening? Okay, first of all, I have to ask. Poodle? Why poodle? That's what you need help with? It just seems like a fundamentally comic dog. They're real intelligent. But if you want to scare someone, a poodle is not your first offer. Why a poodle? Why? Ask him. I did. He doesn't talk. He's a poodle. Ma'am, this is tech support. I'm not a dog historian. Neither am I. I'm an executive assistant at the Food Network. And by the way, I'm he, him, reluctantly. Have you got anything more pressing? Yes. Yes, I definitely do. This demon is not house trained. He's doing his demon business all over the house. And I don't know if this is a thing, but it smells poisonous. He's humping the couch. He threw up on my ficus, which is now charred. There's demon spray all over my statement rug. Bottle that. There are guys who would kill for that spray. Why is this happening? He's a medieval demon. Haven't you ever seen a Bruegel painting? Sure, but couldn't I get one of those demons who's just a nose with feet? Or like a toad bird? I just didn't realize this experience would be so scatological. Stop! Heal! When he showed up and started doing the dishes, I thought he was going to be a neat freak, but apparently that was just for shock value. Oh, There he go! Okay, look, I do not have the bandwidth to house train a demon. How do I get him to stop? I don't know. Well, how do I communicate with him? I don't know. How do I keep him happy? You better find out. How is this tech support? Look, I don't think you realize what you got here. You're dealing with an incredibly negative spiritual conjuration. He's ancient. Yes, he's unsanitized, raw, potent. He can hear you. He stopped. He's looking. I feel it. You do? I do, I do. Does he understand me? He says yes. He says yes? What do you mean he says yes? It just popped into my head. It's like you spoke to me. In my head. Oh, man, is that cool. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. What literal fresh hell is this? What are you looking at? He's gotten bigger? Much bigger. He's he's bloated? This is like a, a real-life Instagram filter. Ah! What? He's growing! And he's drooling and... <gasps> His drool is burning the floor. My security deposit. How big is he? Like hippopotamus big or, or, or bigger. There is a mammoth-sized poodle demon in my junior one bedroom. I am. Mephistopheles, he who sits at the left hand of the Lord of Darkness. Jerry? Jerry, was that you? Can you hear me? I can hear you. I think he's speaking through my- Thou hast summoned me. What is thy will? Yee-haw! What a rush! Jerry, what should I ask for? What do you want? Well, what are the options? Are, are there any restrictions? Or, or, I don't know, blackout dates? What is thy will? Okay, uh, I want to know the human heart. Come on, man! Don't yuck my yum, I'm a writer! I thought you worked for the Food Channel! They're not mutually exclusive, Jerry! I want to be a writer, so I want to know the human heart, okay? I want to ride the subway and, and look people in the eye and know what they're thinking and feeling. I want to hear their thoughts, I want to hear their longings. The moment of perfect childhood bliss they retreat to when they're heartbroken and Pino isn't cutting it. A duck, a ball, a balloon, a warm set of big arms, now lost. I want all of it! Is that all? Um, I'd like abs, if you have some lying around. And what a fame. I mean, sure. And what a pleasure. I could eat. What of love. Oh, um... Yes, sorry, I, I didn't realize love was your metier. You want to know the world, but you do not know yourself. What of hunger? What of touch? I mean, physical touch would be a welcome add-on. But, you know, there are apps for that. Really, what I want is knowledge. There is no knowledge outside the self. Yourself is the center of creation. Your will is the only law. Worship yourself and yourself only. Okay, what if I don't like myself so much? Oh, he's gone. Oh my, where'd you go? Jerry? Are you there? I'm here, I'm here, what happened? I can't even begin to tell you how big he was! He just went poof! Oh, 
Oh, but the smell is still here. Do you sell demon Febreze? Breathe it in. Get used to it. He'll be back. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Welcome to Gray. When life... Jerry speaking, yellow. It's me. The call dropped. There's this one spot in my kitchen. Well, you gotta avoid that spot. I know. I'm trying to figure out how to help you. I know. You better go back to the beginning and do this right. Now, you say Mephistopheles came back and communicated with you. How did you understand him? He actually came back as a grad student, wearing this disgusting 90s Wookiee fur coat. And he spoke to me. He said, so, what do you want? Have you decided or did you need a minute? And I said, well, I already told you. I want knowledge. And he said, I have something better. So what happened next? Chop, chop! Okay, so TLDR, I meet cute this brilliant, hilarious, unobtainably gorgeous classical pianist who does competitive, naked yoga. And in a historic first, I do not mess things up. Mephistopheles tells me everything to say, everything to do, to make this man fall completely in love with me. I can't believe it. It is thrilling and unexpected and completely intoxicating. But does not count? Does he love me? Or is he possessed? Can it be both? It's both. Is it, though? Yes, man, that's why you summon a demon to work for you, so he can get you things you want. It ain't that complicated. I don't know, it just doesn't seem right. It's not right. So what? You summoned a demon. That's not right. Your past, right and wrong. Listen, I'm going to level with you. Sooner or later, he's going to ask you to sign a contract. Mephistopheles works for you in this world, and you'll work for him in the next. So, you had better figure out if that's a thing you really want. I'd sign if I had the chance. I have a certain horse I'm trying to bring back from the dead. That tracks. Look, I'm not going to mince words with you. You're being offered a way out of your pathetic, miserable failure of a life. I'm going to give you my private number, Izzy. Whatever you need to get this deal done, I'm going to help you with. If you have a doubt in the middle of the night, you call me. If you have questions, concerns, emergencies... Well, that's very kind of you. You weren't prepared to find Mephistopheles, but I will dang sure prepare you to make use of him. I'm not sure I want to make use of him. Go, gravy. Frankly, I'm not sure he's good at what he does. You don't... What, you're not sure... You... Mephistopheles is good at what he does? You didn't let me finish my love story. This is an example of Mephistopheles being bad at his job. Okay, so I've fallen in love with Alex. My pianist's name is Alex. He confesses that he still lives with his high school sweetheart, Annie. Annie is delicate, mentally fragile. The vibe between them is very glass menagerie. Alex dumps Annie. Annie disappears. They find her body floating up in the Bronx of a spot called Rat Island. Suicide. Alex's mother stops talking to him. His friends disown him. Alex loses his job even because he was working for Annie's dad. I ruined Alex's whole life. I know it. He knows it. Our relationship is over. I'm freaking out. I don't know what to do. And Mephistopheles tells me, just leave. So I do. And I'm free. Great. This is not great. Alex's life is wrecked. So? So everyone should have a happy ending. If Mephistopheles wanted to make me happy... What makes you think he wants to make you happy? Uh, Uh-huh. Why don't you give yourself over to him? Stop resisting. Stop trying to be a good person. Stop lying to yourself. Stop denying what you want. Try listening to your demon. Open yourself to experience. I'll help. Izzy? Jerry, is that you? I can't hear anything. I don't know where I am, but it's very loud. Do you know where I am? Describe your whereabouts. It's a rave, maybe? A very muddy rave on a mountain? It's very Burning Man. Is this hell? You're at Valpurgisnacht? Maybe. What's Valpurgisnacht? The witch's Sabbath, buddy. The devil's square dance. Satan's cotillion. I'm here, too. You are? Thank God. Thank goat. What? When you're here, you say thank goat. Otherwise, it's rude. Where are uh, you? Okay, I, I'm right by a swarm of naked ladies riding on giant pigs. Are you by a big tower? I am. Can you see a giant black pentagram flag? I'm right under it. I see you. Oh, I see you. I'm hanging up. Hi. Hello. Howdy. Where are we? Central Germany, the Alps. Ugh, the one day I leave the house without a sweater. Come on, I'll show you around. Sit for a moment. I'm experiencing a lot of 
Sensory overload. How are you looking at your feet half the time? Look, I have a fear of fire, blood makes me queasy, I'm very sensitive to strong smells, and Satanist imagery is just not my aesthetic. I got most excited when I saw the nose with feet. It's a real celebrity sighting for me. So we haven't found the thing you like yet. We're just getting started. Whatever you want to try, you can try. We just met in person. Sid, tell me about yourself. Don't punk out now, Izzy. Come on. Time's a wasting. You ask me what I want, that's what I want. Talk to me. Have you been to a lot of these? Valpurgis schnocks? This is my 34th Witch's Sabbath. Took me 10 years to get an invitation. No wonder you hate me. Should we go? Uh, how often do you summon a demon? Three, four times a year. It's labor intensive because I do everything the old fashioned way with real ingredients. Take it you don't use gray kits. Gray demon kits are trash mostly. Their quality got run into the ground. They, they, they summon these sickly, nervous, high strung spirits. You better off buying a Roomba. But then again, they design these things for guys like you. You got a real demon, you don't even know what to do with it. You're weak, you should have a weak kit. That's just the reality. What, what's, what's that look for? I just had an image pop into my head. What was it? You in the jungle with blood and mud on your hands, shaking, scared, crying. How did you? Oh my God, this is incredible. I, I can see it. See what? I can see it all, I can see your life. It's like a map or a house or a city. I can walk through your life in Houston, your house, your truck, your anger, your longing. All right, I do not care for this. I do not like this one. Your kids, on the day each one was born, and on the day they stopped talking to you, your wife running her van through your garage door to punish you, the girl at the shooting range breaking your heart. Stop, that's You're not funny. chili. You make yourself one big vat of chili for the week and you eat it for every meal with raw carrots and broccoli. Stop. I see you in a thrift store in Honolulu buying an old book about demons. Stop. I see you as a little boy. Stop. But Jerry, this is incredible. I can see inside your life. You stay out of my brain or I will kill you and sell your bones to occult bookshops. Jerry, where are you going? Don't leave me here. I don't know how to get back out. Ex excuse me. Sorry. Uh, oh, oh, miss. Was that your flipper? Sorry. Uh, Jerry, wait. Welcome to Gray, the realm where your path has led. My name is Jerry. How can I help? Hi. Serial number? You know my serial number. So how can I help? I called to apologize. That's unnecessary. I truly did not mean to hurt your feelings. I don't have feelings. Can I help you with anything else today? I know you're upset, Jerry. I can see inside you. Sir, this is a technical support line. Can I help you with anything technical? Yes, actually. I'm wondering if we could transfer Mephistopheles to you. No, thank you. Okay, you're proud. I get that. Let me explain my thinking. I initially decided to summon this demon because my ex was published in The New Yorker. I thought if I could discover the secrets of the human heart, I could be a great writer. But it turns out that seeing and hearing everyone's secrets is a bit overwhelming. I alienated several members of my friends and family plan, and when I went to my writer's group, it turns out they all secretly hate my stories. Plus, everyone on the street is so desperately sad. I don't want this anymore. Please, take this Mephistopheles kit off my hands. Not interested. I know you want it. Not like this. Come on! Don't you have a horse to resurrect? Don't talk about my horse! Okay, okay, okay. I'm sorry. I'll leave Jethro out of it. I... Look, I know that you're very stubborn. I don't need and your And that you help. have problems accepting help, my goodness. And I definitely don't need your pity. Please don't cry. I don't. Ever. It's been my pleasure to assist you today. Were you happy with- uh, Jerry, I would like to be your friend. I don't have friends. I'm aware. And my so-called friends don't like me consorting with demons. They want me to stop summoning. I know. Again, I know everything about you. Then why aren't you running the other way screaming? Because you were kind to me? Maybe? Because as much as you hate to admit it, you do have a little good inside you? I'm not sure. I'm surprised as you are. Believe me, I have a very rigorous friend screening process that almost nobody passes. You make 
bad choices, Izzy. You're right. You deserve to lose this demon. Undoubtedly. You want to go back to being a regular, normal idiot? With the friends? Yes. I'm not accepting anything you give me. Okay, I have an idea. And I'm not saying that this is inspired by my intimate working knowledge of the inside of your brain. I'm going away to Fire Island for a long weekend. Sans abs, tragically, couldn't figure that one out. And the kit will just be in my apartment. Anybody could climb up the fire escape and take it. I don't lock my window. Jerry, are you there? I don't believe in saying thank you. Well, I do. I wouldn't have made it through this whole ordeal without you. I know that's right. Okay, then. Okay. I'm going to get off the phone now. I'm going to deactivate my demon. Jerry? It's been my pleasure to assist you. Were you happy with your service today? Yes. Goodbye, Izzy. Goodbye, Jerry. I hope to hear from you. You just heard... Tech Demons by Sarah Gancher. It was directed by Mark Bruni and starred J.O. Sanders as Jerry and the voice of Mephistopheles, Vera Barron as the voice of Great Tech Support, and Isaac Oliver as Izzy. Original music is by Broadway composer and sound designer Dan Moses Schreier. Playing on air thanks Josie Merck, the sponsor of the James Stevenson Commissions, for making this new comedic short possible. I'm Sarah Gancher, and I am the playwright. I'm Isaac Oliver. I played Izzy. I'm Mark Bruni. I'm the director. I'm Jay O. Sanders, and I played Jerry. Welcome, everyone. Sarah, you were commissioned by playing on air as a James Stevenson commission. So you knew comic, you knew short. Can you remember how you arrived at this play, Tech Demons? You know, I have been writing a lot of comedies that are about very heavy subjects recently and a lot of funny things about big, big, big ideas. And after this whole long stretch of COVID that we're not really quite out of yet as of this taping, I just really wanted to have fun. And I felt like that this commission specifically was an invitation to do something just to laugh purely. And I've always loved Faust, and I had a nutty idea about Faust with a tech support line. Didn't get too much deeper than that. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Izzy and Jerry are both pretty miserable people, human beings. Why is misery so reliably comic, do you think? I think, Sarah, despite your insistence that this play is nothing but comic, there are serious themes in it of finding meaning and finding connection. And certainly in this period that we're coming out of where no one has had a chance to have that kind of in-person connection, these two characters finally getting off the phone and connecting for the first time does have a resonance that is uh, beyond comic, perhaps. And I do think that a lot of my favorite comedy is about characters who are trapped in one way of seeing or living in the world and can't seem to find any other way of existing. And if they were able to find a different way to be, all their problems would be solved, but they just keep on, you know, using the same doomed, hilarious strategy. I love that so much because it is so much of what we see around us. And I think it is actually the source of much of the misery in the world. So I don't think that it's about comedy is about misery. I think that comedy and misery spring from the same well. Well, misery, I think, is also about wallowing in a way that desperation has a forward energy about it. Like there's something about being desperate to achieve something. These characters are still pursuing something. So that the, and the wall that they're hitting up against is what makes it funny, I think. You all deal with comedy in your careers. When did you realize your affinity to comedy? I I think one of the things that I liked the most about comedy was the thing that was kind of missing out of our day to day, which is an audience. I mean, is having the the chance to hear a room full of people all laugh together. My started my career working for Jerry Zaks, and he he has a comment that he says is that the sound of an audience laughing together is the sound of them falling in love, and I think that's so beautiful. And there's something that's so special about that collective experience of being able to exhale, to appreciate something, to laugh at something together. And that's something that we haven't had and at all. But that, that's one of the reasons that I love 
comedy is because it requires a vocal response. Well, and it requires listening and it requires engagement. You know, I mean, I, I write comedic material, I perform comedic material, and this last 16 months has been utterly devastating to just be you know, sitting in your apartment and reading things into a phone or, you know, just utter silence. And you wonder, am I reaching anyone? And there's just something about comedy, especially where if they're laughing, they're listening to you. If they're laughing, they're in it with you. And it is just, it's a wonderful feeling that I very much miss. I think part of what got me through the pandemic was the fact that my wife and I both make each other laugh. Mm. <laughs> You know, that you, you do have an audience with the, the person who is always around yeah. and the smallest thing sometimes can can give you back that reassurance that what you're doing is being heard and being appreciated. Yeah. Sometimes it's just a look. Sometimes they start laughing because they know what you're, right. <laughs> what you're thinking. <laughs> yeah. I, I also think I'm, I embrace high tragedy. I mean, I've played some of everything and and I I love the the Greeks and high Shakespearean tragedy and all but I always find the comedy rippling through it and that's what I love because it's people trying desperately to escape in any way they can it's almost like getting a, a getting ice cubes on a hot day you just have to do something to help you get through the rest, that's what, what jokes and, and humor are about, sort of the, the door that you kick to get some fresh air when you're stuck in a stifling hot place. It's uh, it's the necessary thing, and it's very, very human because everybody goes together. They go, ah, and that's the laughter. Jay, you've played so many roles in your career. In a situation like this, where you've got just a few hours to realize your character, were you aware of what you pull from your toolbox? No. Everything tells you something, and then you go back to zero again. And you, you know, you, But you know inherently, you recognize funny things, you recognize ideas, you recognize themes, you know how to ask a a real question of the other actors and, or in this case, actor, uh, who is terrific. And every everything comes back to the same thing. It's all about being a human being and walking through life in a way that people, uh, that your audience recognizes themselves in and finds it funny or finds it moving or finds it whatever. But it's the, it's the personalization so that, so that it's familiar. Sarah, in the play, there's no knowledge outside of the self. Where did you get those lines? I may have uh, adapted that from Goethe, maybe, but let's just say that I think that that is what a demon would say, right? That that that, that, that the sort of the the angelic response is to be thinking about other people and prioritizing other people and to be giving and kind, and that the demonic impulse is to put yourself at the center and be the world be damned. And I think that if we consider hell being other people or uh, hell being stuck in a pattern of hurt each other that that's that's the sort of attitude that that comes from right even though it can be certainly a really seductive idea to many right anyway it's been a lot of fun having you all here it's really been great thanks for your wonderful play thank yeah. you thank you for having all of us yeah. yes thank, thank you, you so, so much, much. Yes. The, these <laughs> wonderful yeah. actors yeah. and delightful. Uh, delightful play to get to work on you've been listening to playing on air Great American short plays with great American actors. Theme music by Tom Cochan. Play music by Dan Moses Schreier. Marketing and communications, Avon Jones. Audio editing, Rachel Creedberg. Recording and sound design, John Kilgore. Playing on Air is distributed by PRX, Public Radio Exchange. For Playing On Air, I'm your host, Claudia Catania. Thanks for listening. <laughs>